Good afternoon. This is Shan Dunn with Altair Global. Welcome, and thank you for attending our webinar today, Do Your Relocation Policies Support Your Recruiting and Retention Goals? I'm very pleased to introduce our presenter, Ed Marshall, Practice Leader, Global Mobility with the Impact Group. Ed is a global mobility expert with more than 20 years in the relocation transition industry. He has used his expertise to assist hundreds of organizations in transitioning their workforce around the globe. We look forward to his expertise and his insight on how you can make your relocation policy support your recruiting and retention goals and the items you need to keep in mind to uh, help them maximize that potential. So with that, it's my pleasure to get our presentation started and hand the microphone over to Ed Marshall. Ed? Shan, thank you so much. Um, it's, a, it's always a great opportunity to, uh, to kind of share a little bit of uh, what we see changing in the policies and, and how we try to address those. So today I, I wanted to kind of give you a quick summary first of the areas that we're going to um, talk about today. So from a talent acquisition and developmental challenges, so often on the relocation side we don't realize that we have uh, someone to relocate until months and months or weeks and weeks or days and days go by with the recruiters and senior management trying to identify uh, the right candidates to get them to the point that they do accept that um, that employment opportunity. Well, for the last five to, to eight years, you all are certainly aware of it, the challenges in getting people to even accept a relocation. Well, during that time period, as the economy has uh, started to move forward a little bit, we have less and less workers in the workforce, the lowest participation level ever, and therefore there are more and more jobs available. And as that affects the, you know, not only the society we live in, but we have more and more challenges with retention. People look at the options about relocating, and in that small piece of the world that uh, the impact group works with in trying to get spouses to accept the move because they, they too have changed. They've been employed longer. They're working with companies with more opportunities, and it becomes more and more of a struggle for for people to relocate. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the, from the recruiting standpoint how the economy is different, how the workforce is different, and then we're going to talking about just the, the overall changes in the demographics and kind of uh, look a little bit more as far as what the definition of the families are that, that we're relocating. And then once we get through all of the issues that are affecting uh, those uh, families that we try to relocate and those employees that we try to redeploy, I wanted to share with you some of the things that, that we hear, as in many cases we're talking to your employees and, and their families, and, and to share with you some uh, opportunities uh, that we're seeing companies do uh, to try to ensure they're getting the right people to relocate. And then we'll kind of finish it up a little bit with what some of the best practices are and certainly how they probably will change again tomorrow. But as the workforce demographics change, then we're going to be faced with our looking at our policies and realizing that most companies uh, don't change the policies quite uh, – we talk about changing. But by the time we get them finalized, many of the reasons that we made the changes has, has already changed again. And we constantly find ourselves uh, guessing to identify – um, do we have the right policy, and, and then how do we measure that? So I'm going to give you a share with you a few ways that might work for you in, in order to do that. So to get started, but we're going to do a, a, a poll question and just see if uh, if what we're hearing is the same that uh, that you're having. I think Shan, do we have a question? Uh, yes, we do, Ed. Everybody, give me a moment to pull that up. All right, our first question, first poll question is sort of taking the pulse of our audience and seeing how much discussion around these topics is happening. So our first poll question, are future talent needs and recruiting challenges being discussed more or less in your organization than in the past? Uh, your choices are less than before, about the same, and more than before. So while that's uh, that's being completed, I was going to share with you a, a, a couple comments that um, a lot of research out now on just kind of redefining in the human resource side as it gets in uh, and, and targeted so often into talent acquisition and, and HR, that there seems to be some separation in compliance and benefits now handling being handled more by corporate HR and then line management handling more of the training and development. 
and the recruiting is still kind of on that pendulum. It's moving back and forth, trying to identify in different organizations how it changes. But the challenge is that uh, there's a, a PricewaterhouseCoopers survey out, and they do a great job. I wanted to share with you that the um, comparisons, that when they ask CEOs what their future their biggest challenges were, um, were this year as well as the last two to three years. The future growth depends on their talent acquisition and the availability to get the talent. They believe that over 30% of the CEOs felt they missed business opportunities to grow their companies in the last 12 months because they just actually did not have the talent ready to take advantage of that. So way up that chain where, where the senior leaders are working on the strategy and growing the businesses, it is very apparent to, to that leadership level that they need to try to get the right people. And trying to find the right people um, is, is always a challenge. Even when we had very high un, unemployment, the, the individual skill set and the people that they're looking for uh, always uh, always is short. All right, Ed, we've got our numbers in, so let's take a look at them. Okay. 3% three, three of our audience said uh, less than before. 30% is being discussed about the same, and, of course, our majority, 67%, uh, these issues are being discussed more than in the past. Well, that's exciting because that, that's what I, I'm not exactly sure how we would have proceeded if it would have been differently than that, but that's going to help us kind of identify. And, and so what I'd like to do now is to share with you why I believe uh, that we as, a, as an industry and we as a workforce are um, experiencing some of those. So we're going to go into a little bit more information about where that shortage, uh, that the shortage does continue. All right, Ed, we're going to go ahead and move on, get started with our next topic, which is talent acquisition and development. Thank you. So wh why do we have the shortages, and, and, uh, and can we see where those different pieces are? You know, a lot of, our, uh, a lot of the work around the world will change based on um, certain corporations' focuses and certain societal changes. But I, I guess what I wanted to share when it comes to um, – trying to get people to be in the right place at the right time would be we start looking at uh, at locations and the shift of work of where are people uh, working now one of the biggest ones and, and I will say that I think it probably affects all of us uh, attending today is the ability to be able to work from home so over 23 percent of the uh, of the employees are able to work from home on occasion and there's a large sector of um, three, I believe it's close to three and a half to four million people that work from home every day. But uh, of the total workforce, 23% can work from home on, on a going basis um, as they would need to. That has dramatically increased by almost 30% in the last five years. And I'm sure as technology continues to work, we'll find that. But then you realize, I think that has an effect when we get into our, our relocations, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Many of the individuals that were required to, you know, to move uh, hundreds of miles across the country to work in another facility, um, a lot of that work, unless you're involved in, in actually managing the team directly, can be done remotely. So we can see that that is, uh, is creating a challenge. And for those of you that are on the hiring side, you certainly can, can probably uh, continue to explain um, why it's hard to justify moving somebody if they can work from their office or work from their home office, and especially for those that are required to travel anyway. They're traveling and, and then being able to communicate and, and connect on a regular basis. The other type of uh, shift of, uh, of work are the types of people that we're relocating. And as the organizations are talking about skill sets declining, um, I think there's been, as we've watched a little bit of a research in, in the oil business, uh, interesting um, of those, um, we get into a little bit about who's educated and the types of jobs. The seems to be, and this is always a perfect world, you know, for years, especially Americans, we everybody wanted to get a four-year degree, and then they went out and realized they spent um, lots of money, borrowed lots of money, and have very little job opportunities. The choice of a degree uh, also has a lot to do with it. So in many of the STEM practices, you know, the sciences and engineering, that a four-year degree will, will not get you the kind of job 
without going back to get that master's degree for engineering. But when you look at the number of people that are, are educated, and during the last five years, we've had a, a large number of our college graduates that uh, have moved back home because they haven't been able to find a job that would actually pay high enough to be able to have an apartment as, as we've watched rents go up. So I think that that's the, the thing that seems to be changing some of the trends are uh, as people are looking at the, the uh, four-year degree individuals coming out of school and realizing that a large percentage of those people are going into work, into types of work with a degree that really didn't require a four-year degree or a philosophy degree, the history degree, um, and they're going into lower paying jobs. And when you have that type of a situation, so um, a large, you know, the largest uh, bucket uh, of jobs would be certainly that in, in retail sales. And the large percentage of people in retail sales that have a college degree, that pays at, at around $22,000 in, in the U.S. If you look at the vocational schools and the skilled workers, the majority of those jobs coming out with a certificate. Now, they, they may very well have a two-year degree, but having it specialized in uh, petrochemicals or having it uh, in engineering and processing, those people are finishing school in two years into jobs in the $70,000 range. So a lot of the, the workforce and the training that's being needed uh, has dramatically changed in the last 10 years. Therefore, I think we're finding more and more focus from the employer side, trying to find people that have the skill set. And I know on a global basis, we have employers that are willing to train um, you know, the young workers coming into the workforce and retrain employees to be able to hone in on that skill set. So as I shift over and we talk a little about uh, in helping as we work with uh, spouse partners to find employment, there are quite a few skilled workers that they they actually don't need interviewing, coaching as much as they do just how to get their certificates transferred. And in many cases, they're they're going in and earning wages two and three times that of what some of those with the college educations are, uh, or with a college educated um, degree. So in many cases, we're seeing a shift in the type of workers, which is, as you can realize then. Uh, also shifts who it is that, that we're relocating. But I wanted to talk to, uh, the next on pushing some of that um, pressure down as it comes back to the talent development people and whether you're in a talent acquisition side or you're on the development side, there's constant pressure on the inside of the organization as well as external. And I thought I would share with you um, a little bit about that pressure that um, is on the inside. So I kind of default back to the, the CEO survey that I referred to in the, on the last slide. Um, over 66% or two-thirds of the CEOs feel that they're going to get their leadership from within their company in the next three years. So a lot of confidence and pressure. So if that's what the CEOs are saying, so then your internal organizational development, your line managers training people have got a lot of pressure to move people up three years. Their biggest fear, again, almost two thirds, sixty uh, percent, uh, are concerned that they're going to lead, they're going to lose those middle managers because people are not staying with the employers like they used to. Now, we're going to talk a little bit later about some of the differences in the ages, but I thought I'd share with you that overall average in 2015, the tenure of the workforce, the average number of years that people are on the job, have been 4.6 years. Now, the boomers have been on the, in their jobs for over 10 years. The millennials are less than three years. Now, many of you, because I think we're all affected with it, whether um, we have children uh, that are millennials or whether we're working as co-workers with the millennials, um, this year, the millennials and the boomers have equal 25% uh, of the workforce. In the next five years, by 2020, the um, number of boomers will come down about 5% to 20% of the workforce and it will be over 45% of the workforce will be the millennials. So very different, very focused, hardworking, um, and um, merit very much of a collaborative type organization, but less than three years staying in a job. Nothing compared to what people did 20 years ago, 10 years ago. So the pressures that are on the organization to try to do that development 
has, uh, has changed dramatically. So you can see that the pressure from the corporations and in, in the types of workers they're needing, and then the internal and external pressure within the organization from the talent development side. One of the trends that I've noticed this last year, and I think it's a good thing, and we have many clients that are, are doing that, is for internal or current employees being transferred, uh, have, have come out with a 25% of the transferees would be female employees and are really targeted on how to do that uh, in order to find the opportunities and to support the female employees as they're relocating um, at a level that um, I think in the past we just didn't recognize how challenging it was. But as the companies are trying to get them to move, they're very quick to talk about the fact that it's not easy being a, you know, a working mother and it's not easy getting uh, an accompanying um, spouse to, to relocate. Um, and so the companies, I think, are focusing on that. So I, we have several clients that are, are really tracking the number of females that are being uh, relocated to try to do that. From a single standpoint, usually it is about 50-50, but on the, uh, the couple families, um, the targeting at 25% is, is uh, pretty aggressive. But again, it's that internal uh, driver for the, uh, the acquisition part. So, so let's look a little bit more about uh, how the democratic, demographic shifts are occurring. So the age and genders, uh, in, these are pretty much known factors, but it's uh, always intriguing to me a little bit when you stop and look at it because uh, the workforce has got its separate genders, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about who it is that we're moving. Uh, and, and as you move your families, I'm pretty sure you're going to fall into that category as well. So we know for a fact that the population um, it has shifted somewhat. We also know that um, we, we have a higher educated women in the workforce than we've ever had before. And that bracket prim primarily falls in that uh, 20 to 35 year old. So there, there are more highly educated females in the workforce than there are men at this particular point. So, you know, if, if your objective were 25% uh, uh, hiring and moving, at least you have that going in your favor. So you do have a lot of quality um, people to work with. I thought I'd share with you, though, that the um, age that people are getting married, uh, for those of you that are old enough to realize the average woman was married at age 20 in 1960. Now it's 27. For men, um, same uh, kind of relationship and as that has moved forward, men are now waiting to get married to be tw to add to 29. So then people say, well, is that really good or bad? Um, there's uh, some research studies out there that actually show that it has it benefits women much greater. And the statistic uh, that they share is for women with a college degree who wait until they're 30 to get married. Uh, will end up earning in their 30s and 40s will earn 56% more money than their the counterpart uh, female who uh, got married at, at 20 or under. So um, from that standpoint, we keep wondering why the population has grown so much and, and why um, the younger population aren't getting married in their early 20s. Um, a lot of it is due to education requirements, um, a lot of studies out there on, on, on the debt and uh, so we know that um, our younger population are, are waiting on an average of seven to nine years longer to, to get married. The other interesting factor as well when it gets to who's making up the workforce, the number of women and um, having their first child has a tendency to, uh, to be later, to be in their 30s. Um, which then gives us the idea that now there are new hires that are coming in, and as we're looking at who we're shifting, they are pr predominantly going to be that 30 to 40 year old, and that's that's at the point where um, they start to uh, start a family uh, as they're moving. So that's what the workforce is faced with. So we talked a little bit earlier about the challenges of, of who they're hiring. I thought I'd share with you a little bit about the family size and, and the shift that we've watched in, in the um, the makeup of the family. The actual singles now make up 28% um, of the the mix of, of families, and um, two couples, you know, a, a couple, um, if you will, are about 34%. So that kicks us back over to a couple moving with kids, which is always a large piece of uh, of the business. 
that um, has changed in the, in the last 20 years. It's reduced by 30%. So we know that the average family size now is, is 2.54 um, across the United States, which is dropping. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it's, it's dropping at about 10% every five years. So um, we have smaller size families. Uh, I think those of us that are in the relocation business will tell you that we probably are seeing more blended families with kids from both of the parents put together uh, more often than what the average workforce would be. But I just wanted to get a little bit of comparison as to um, the population of what's defined in the families. The other thing that we find and watch is the, the definitions in the policies are opened up a little bit more. We, we know that there's a percentage of families that are actually moving or, or uh, relocating with, uh, with elder parents. Um, we, we just wouldn't have time today, but there's some great studies that talk about the um, challenges for a couple that uh, now as we have the, our parents are living longer, um, just being able to care for themselves, being able to be mobile to get around, and the ability then to, um, people are living a lot longer. So how do families build that into the program? So we, we, we've watched a, uh, a large increase in the number of policies that now are open, and uh, some of the numbers are, are very high. 50% uh, of the companies surveyed in one study say that they do have provisions to assist with uh, elder care um, for their employees that are relocating. And I think that might be a little bit um, misquoted. I think that the, the possibility of what they're including in that is the ability that if they're fully dependent that they have the opportunity to put tax uh, pre-tax dollars away. But we, we have seen an increase in, in elderly parents. And, and honestly, you know, the sandwich generation where we're moving uh, elderly parents or, or parents with the family to help take care of the kids. So um, I don't know that it's that different. It just seems to be more predominant in the cost of housing and, and being able to stay together as a family unit. Um, there, there has been quite a trend there. The next one that we see big increases are our single population with pets. The known single population rec recruiting or, or actually being relocated now is uh, is twice what it was uh, 30 years ago. So we have people at, uh, at all different brackets. Uh, on this particular slide, we talk about singles with children. We know that there's a, a large percentage of that, but I can share with you that from a relocation standpoint, um, we find about, uh, and you have to be a little bit careful with this, but <clears throat> when we, we're working with singles, um, uh, one third of the single population or about 10 percent um, of that group actually have children to be concerned about. Now they may be in college, uh, they, you know, but they are a single parent or they're moving with two kids. So we see more and more programs including singles and especially the single parents so they're, they're not getting eliminated. And there are several that you know may only have custody of the children during, uh, during the holidays or the summers, but they also have needs on just making sure they have those particular pieces uh, that they need to be able to, to move forward uh, in any type of a, of a relocation to, to do that. The one other part that I kind of wanted to share when we talk about the um, numbers of, of spouse partners, in 1960 or, or, or 50 years ago, 72% um, were, were married couples, and, and that has now declined in half. Only 50% in 2010 are a couple. So, that, you know, that obviously the, the net result there is we end up with uh, certainly a lot more singles, uh, certainly by choice or, or just not married. So it has changed the policies. It's hard to tell, um, you know, the, the makeup of that. Now with a lot of the federal laws changing, um, we find very few that are, are singling out. Uh, fiancés were, have always been a challenge. Do, are you, do you have a date to get married because we're not moving you as a married couple? A and then the same thing that would always fall through with alternate lifestyles or same-sex partners. Are they included or not? And so we're seeing those kind of shifts. Uh, and I think that's very normal um, as, as we kind of look at who makes up the families and, and how the policies are, are a little bit different. I did want to, um, and actually, I think we have another survey question, and, and I'll share this other great philosophy that I have with you uh, while we're doing the survey question. Right, you are, Ed. Let me get this one pulled up. Uh, this survey question centers around 
uh, policy tiers. So let me get that launched for everyone. So our next question asks, does your current relocation policy offer different tiers or plan levels? And your choices are no, a yes with one to three levels, yes with four to five levels, or yes with six or more levels. And we'll give everyone just a little bit of time to vote on that one there. What I was going to uh, share with you as you're completing that was as we watched the uh, age of uh, couples getting married and then as we watched them relocate, we always talk about the, the correlation of college uh, debt and the reason that maybe kids are waiting uh, later to, uh, to get married. I think that's an obvious issue, but I, there was a recent study out by Zillow that I thought was intriguing because I think many of us in the relocation business felt that the reason they're not buying homes is because they have so much debt um, that they can't afford to buy the home. And I thought the statistics that they shared were pretty interesting. It appears with a college degree, if one of the couple has a college degree, um, they um, about 30% of them are buying a home in, in their 30s. So the those of us that sell homes for a living, we realize then that, that there is hope. If they have a graduate degree, if one of the two have a graduate degree, there is actually a substantially higher, almost 10% more will have a home in their 30s um, at, that, at that particular time. So, you know, and again, if, you, if we went back 30 years, that was happening when they were, they were in their 20s. But there, there is a, appears to be very little correlation about having so much debt as much as the, maybe the confidence that they'll, they'll have a higher earnings potential. Um, so I, I'm not sure that how statistically perfect that is, but I thought it was interesting because I've, I've heard that and I've probably said that many times that I would imagine with the amount of debt that our younger population have that they're in no place to correlate the, the home sale side. The interesting part of the whole study was the fact that um, with rent being so high, the actual uh, increases in renting probably are keeping people from being able to save enough money to buy. And so there's probably more of a correlation uh, associated with being able to come up with the money for, uh, for the mortgages for the homes. But um, it appears that those that are highly educated and, and are carrying debt uh, are more likely to, uh, to buy a home. We talked a little bit more earlier about the millennials. They still, you know, one of the big goals in their life is to uh, to have a home and start a family. It's just it appears that could be 20 years later than it was uh, 30 or 40 years ago. All right, thanks, Ed. With that, let's take a look at our numbers. Okay, we had 11% for no, 47% for yes with one to three levels, 36% with yes four to five levels, and then finally 6% with the six or more uh policy tiers. So, Ed, how does that look compared to uh, what you encounter with the clients that you work with? The, um, the overall average that I've been able to come up with is about two and a half is the, is the right. So the percentages are very close. So we have a good group. It, uh, they seem to be normal. <laughs> so that, that appears to be about right. And we, we do see policies with six or more as well, but they're very usually very defined. And uh, we see a lot more of that on, on the global side. But, no, I think the 47%. So you can see that if you add those two together, you know, we're up 80, over 80% are in, uh, well, actually 89% uh, are in tiered programs. And I want to try to share with you today that I think that may be some of the changes that we're going to see um, as we continue to, to move forward. So I think we're ready to go, Shan, when you are. All right, Ed, our next topic up is uh, the problem of conflicting issues. So as we mentioned a little bit earlier, as we watch the, um, the policy benefits and the, the tiering certainly is how we get there by trying to reduce the cost, target the, the right policy for the right individuals. And now suddenly as we see the needs from coming back on the talent side, um, the corporations are struggling. Uh, there are so many opportunities out there for people to find jobs. And we as a company, and, and, and as we have better uh, abilities with our computers and our tracking systems to control the cost and to try to make sure that we're reducing and pulling out any excess money that we have, we put the, the recruiters and, and put ourselves, ourselves as providers and, and corporate clients trying to maintain to keep the cost down and the talent needs keep going up. And so, I, you know, I certainly don't need to share with you that the, the cost of moving somebody 
uh, versus hiring them locally uh, is um, is kind of a no-win benefit if you can get the same talent. But if you remember, over 50% of the senior uh, executives want to develop from within their organization, which is good when we have to move people. But it's really hard when you're putting, you're asking people to relocate under a policy benefit that doesn't meet their their current needs or their family needs in order to do that. So I just wanted to, to kind of share with you that all of the things we talked about the hiring side, the market's better, people are finding jobs quicker. Um, I wanted to um, identify the fact that I'm sure as you're looking at your policies, you know, people aren't tickled to death. Now, we all know that if you haven't moved in a while uh, and if you're not a multiple mover, you don't really compare the policy to what it is, and, and about 50% of the people we're moving are new hires. But I think as we try to move the talent, the current employees that have been on jobs or been on assignments before, we're going to find the fact that they have time to to make decisions and the, the sad part of it is they have time to look at alternatives. And uh, as we get into some of the best practices, I'll share some of those stories with you uh, as well. So now we're going to talk a little about the factors in the, in the decision itself and the selection of the transferees. I think that um, what we're seeing, and, and again, these are just all types of recruiters that, that we're working with and trying to get people to uh, accept the transfer, and to, to stay engaged, stay focused on it, and, and to be able to provide um, the skill that we're trying to move is making sure that, that as we're selecting the individuals that we're doing the best that, that we can. And so often, I think, uh, one of the areas that companies, um, and I, I would say that all companies uh, would fall in this category, we're not really good at having the open discussions with the employees about the likelihood of them wanting to, to relocate or transfer. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, in the future about the fact that uh, how mobile are they really? When you have people already in an organization that have all types of reasons that they would never move or they, they will talk to their coworker and they're, well, that's just something we'll never move, um, you find more and more companies looking uh, with the short time that we have people in positions and they're trying to maximize the investment of making a relocation, there's got to be better ways to determine the, their mobility, their being the employee. Are they likely to move or not? We have uh, tools that we work with companies to identify the, likely, uh, the, the likelihood that they will relocate when they need them. So as they're out hiring new talent and bringing them into you know, different locations, um, companies hiring people, before they put them into that hypo development area in California, they'll run them through an assessment to determine are they likely they will be willing to move to Boston or not. Because if they're not willing to move there and they have to replace a position in Boston, but they need to replace that person with a trained individual, then maybe the person that they're hiring in, in California is not the right person to plan on moving to Boston because if that person right up front says they're not mobile, then you've spent a lot of time and energy only to be disappointed. And quite honestly, if the person doesn't want to relocate, the chances of keeping them in that other operation are bad. So there's a lot of logistics and, and uh, thought processing when it comes to try to retain a workforce that we're seeing more and more of the recruiters working with. And that's just trying to find out, okay, we know we, that you want to be trained. We know that we're committed to engage, getting you training in our organization. And then we also know that we're not located in one facility. We're going to have to move people, and the likelihood of that position relocating is greater. So let's talk about that in the early stages and then move forward. The spouse and partner needs. We know that uh, 65% um, of the transferees um, have a uh, are in a, a dual career situation. It may be that um, it's part time. It may be that it's full time. And uh, I, be, I believe about 25% of the time, the spouse is making more money than the employee. So trying to identify are there needs there and the likelihood that the spouse is going to move. Um, we could go on if we, we had the time and I could share with you all of the stories that we hear when an individual will call in and, and say, oh, don't worry, my husband will use your services. He's going to need a job when we get there. But if we never have an opportunity to talk to him about removing some of the hurdles, removing some of the fear of relocating, there's a likelihood that he'll never engage in the program. 
So just being able to talk to them about their needs and about what it would be like for them or the likelihood of them finding those opportunities uh, in the new location uh, are just one more way of trying to make sure that you're bringing all of the decision makers in. And you know, as you all know from a relocation standpoint, it doesn't take a whole lot to turn a relocation bad. It just takes a, a whole lot of listening to try to identify the right way um, to, to find out if these people are likely to move or not. The other one that, that we struggle with a lot is just the timing of the physical relocation. So years and years ago when everybody was buying homes, we, we had a pretty good idea when the spouse would be able to, to relocate. We also have a lot of employees that are relocating. They're finishing up, um, you know, um, their graduate work. So identifying when the company needs the person there. We're recently looking at some policies where the retention is getting to be so hard to um, to retain people to stay within the company, and by that relocating, that they're actually making the um, the spouse partner assistance available a year before the physical relocation date because they believe if the spouse can find the right job and move ahead, then the timing is more on the company of trying to get the employee uh, to relocate uh, at, on the time period. So you see a lot of uh, creative ways of trying to work around the physical relocation. So often, and, and I think overall average, um, the relocation management companies and, and most companies give people six to eight weeks to physically start their job. And that's about the average time that we receive an authorization to start working with the with the family. But time and time again, and, and I, you know, there's all kind of vocations this way. But we'll get somebody in the summer who's a school teacher, and they just are so frustrated that they stayed and didn't move because they had to finish teaching school until June, and now they're moving to uh, you know to a new location three four hundred miles away, and they can't get a teaching job. Well, those teaching jobs were all filled in February. So again, the timing of when you're going to be in the new location is so critical when we can get to that and help people identify those type of things. So the good news is when it comes to the, the actual size of the spouse partner, it's a great time to be looking for a job. It's a tough time to be giving up a really good job and having a lag period and trying to find another job in, in a different location. So just be, as you always, we're always looking at the, the decisions, is to be proactive uh, in providing the type of support and talking about the types of things that are problems for people to move so that you can um, remove those. So often, it's not uh, an insurmountable hurdle. It's just the fact that nobody ever asks. And so I think that the, the one thing that we've learned is to, if you are considering people to move, to openly ask the individual and ask the family um, what, what part of the move they're struggling with or what do they think about the move. And if they deselect themselves, uh, hopefully those, you know, years ago, those were career-ending decisions when you turned down a relocation. And we're finding now that almost 70 to 80% of the companies said, no, if they turn down a relocation, by all means, we're not eliminating their position. They can stay in their old position. Um, we just would like to have them in a different one. So I believe we're going to ask another quick question here, and I think that's our last uh, question. Correct you are, Ed. So let me get our third and final polling question launched. This question asks, does your organization offer a pre-decision program prior to a relocation? And your choices are no, yes with a real estate and financial focus, yes with a focus on the family factors, or finally yes with a focus on both of those factors. And I realize so much of this um, it doesn't always get down to, uh, I'm sure every, each and every one of you would say, boy, I wish our organization would do more of that and, and ask more of those questions because uh, I think our experience says that whenever you don't, you end up with all types of exceptions, everybody asking for this as an exception or, or that as an exception. And there are, we all know, there are just certain people that should never move. So. Okay, Ed, it looks like our numbers are in. Okay, we have 56% for no, a yes for the real estate financial focus. We actually had 0% for the family factors focus, and then 21% for the focus on both real estate financial and family. So how does that compare with uh, your experiences? 
Well, actually, that I, I guess that uh, it surprises me a little bit, and I'm, I'm sure that um, the next slide that we go to will answer that. Those are I, I, I believe that um, I've seen as much as 70% don't do anything, so I think the group is a little bit better than that. And again, the mix a lot of are, are you're doing homeowners uh, versus renters. That definitely uh, the real estate uh, issue has been a challenge for people. So, um, and, and you know, I think both. Uh, the twenty one percent that's about right. I think we're picking up on the on uh, on both of those so um but let's go to the next slide shannon and i I'll share with you why um uh, we we see these uh trends so um I apologize that's just a little bit cloudy, but I wanted to share with you and and this is a two thousand fifteen and many of you that have done this for a while have seen this for the last ten years it's been tracked. Family issues and ties are the number one reason for relocation refusals. Spouse partner employment is a number two. And, and I honestly believe that number three item are the things that people don't want to tell the employer about. So when you look at the top reasons for people not taking a relocation, um, these are the reasons that, that they share with. And we see these every day. But as you notice, if you've got the top three reasons and you're not asking about those, then the chances of getting the people to accept the relocation can be a little bit greater if you're asking uh, those issues um, ahead of time. And I, I'm always amazed that um, when we talk to the employee and then the, we ask the employee to let us talk to, um, you know, to their spouse and explain what we're going to do, so how often the employee doesn't have a clue what their spouse does in their vocation and on the other hand, the employee will say, I'm not even going to consider that because of the issues that we're dealing with with our family. So there's a lot of reasons that people um, refuse, and, and we track this as we do assessments. We know that 30% or 30 to 35% of the individuals will turn down a relocation. Um, I always kind of like this study because it breaks it into the categories. If um, most uh, corporate clients will tell you, that it's a physical location. I don't want to move to New York. I don't want to move to San Francisco. And when you dig in there and start talking about it, it has nothing to do. Um, we do thousands of pre-decision assessments, and I have never seen any come back that was relo that had a geographical factor. It's always something about the family, something about the makeup. Uh, of the family or special issues or needs that are are driving those decisions and, and nothing about the geographical location of it. So, uh, again, this is uh, 2015. Now, five years ago, the housing and mortgage um, and, you know, the negative equity were up in number one and two, but um, family issues, spouse, partner, and, and personal reasons were still in the top five and, and have been for as long as these surveys have been done. So, that's uh, that's why I think it's important that we're asking those before we put people into those uh, moves. And if, if we try to increase the uh, acceptance rate, uh, asking sometimes how to deal with them, and quite honestly, they're not all major, just having the conversation with them uh, and identifying how to uh, answer uh, their concerns will get you a, a yes versus a, a no. So. So how do you, you change it a little bit, and how do you make the program a little bit more of a, uh, of a, a success? You probably have a dozen different ways. I find it's important, and, and when we do assessments, is we don't go down a list and tell them all the different things that they're going to have. We ask them what's important to them, and, and then instead of saying, you know, what do you need, half these people have never moved before. They don't know what they need. And I think you'll see that uh, a lot when you deal with lump sums. They don't have a clue what they're going to need because they have no experience. Um, and we watch that in the different needs and stuff. And, and they do um, they do want to have verification. We see that in millennials. We see that um, they want somebody to be able to acknowledge that they're going to make the right decision. They'll make the decision. They'll do it really quickly. But they, they I always like, they, they, I want to run it by you. I want to bounce this off of you. Uh, to, to get some validation um, uh, based on the decision they're going to, to make. I also think that the, uh, allow the external experts to discuss the employee and spouse desires and challenges. And the reason I say that is on, on so many of those personal issues, um, just over the years I've had people say, is this truly confidential? 
And if you can let them share with you what that issue is, knowing that it's not going back to the company, because in many cases the company doesn't even want to know this stuff, you can help them come to the conclusion that yes, it is. I should we sh we can do this. I know we can do it. Here's what we need, and there are others who need to get good information so they can make the right decision. That at this particular time in their life, it's not a good time for them to relocate their family in order to do that. I also have people who will come up and say. Um, my uh, my husband has a master's degree. Will he be able to find a job? Well, you know what? Uh, until you know what it's in and if he wants to practice in that, uh, what type of income is he making? Where? So, so often, and you all are put in that position, you get people asking you, you really don't know. So you need to talk to somebody who can relate to that and give them the best information and then be okay with the fact that uh, when you're willing to listen and make assessments, they're not always going to jump at it, and it's not always one where you have to offer them more money to do it. It's listen to what those challenges are in order to do that. And the other is just to set the expectation of the, organizational, uh, the organization's culture. Every company is different. So whenever they, somebody says, well, it's okay, uh, I'm going to be able to transfer with my company. And there is a big breakdown in, in the onboarding because in one region they, they operated a certain way, had a different manager, had a different relationship. When you throw that culture and then you put a relocation on with somebody with a family, you are really struggling because now you're moving, uh, you're, you're putting a lot of dynamics together in a very short period of time. So making sure as the, the organization itself is going through changes that the, um, the, the new employee going in understands that. And likewise, we see it where a spouse says, oh, you know, probably 20% say, I think I can transfer with my own company, I can work from home, is to, to really help them go through that whole process and determine, is that the best opportunity for you? Because you don't want to turn down other opportunities or take less income, uh, or you, you're going to have a different working relationship within that company. So to look at all of the views and empower them to make the right decision. The timing is critical. Um, the longer you delay in letting somebody make that decision, you know, if you can move that, um, there are, I, I, I just know of dozens of companies that we do group moves on, and when they say they'll have two to three years uh, to, to make a decision, in this labor market when 65% of the spouses are working, those employees are not going to move because the spouses have a good job and from the time they try to get you to give me another month, give me, let me decide what we're going to do, they'll end up not actually taking that job because they're not going to go through the hassle. You know, we used to say breaking even. Why move from a home I own, a neighborhood I know, my spouse has a great job, everybody's connected. I now have a year or two to look for another job. And that's where that whole retention of the current employees are. We're ju we just don't see the people jumping to move. It's not that they were were financially profiting. It's a fact that it's just complicated to move. And uh, regardless of... Uh, you know, the, the, all the physical aspects of it, you're still going into areas that you're not sure of in order to do it. <clears throat> and from our standpoint is to understand how the timing plays into that job search and, and how we do that uh, to try to match it up. You know, we, we have many programs where we create job openings for people, but if they're waiting for a house to sell, we in turn uh, never give them the job opening um, while they're still waiting to get an offer on the house. So we have to time when do we move them into that next stage if they're waiting because nothing's more frustrating for a family to have the spouse staying in the old location waiting to get the household to be able to move. So hopefully with the economy doing better now, um, we can do some better timing in order to move that forward. So just to kind of wrap it up here, I was just going to give you a, a few more comparisons on there are lots of different ways to, to improve the acceptance rate. So as, as the recruiters are looking at it and uh, you're trying to figure out how to do that, I would encourage them to uh, look at having somebody assess those needs. And, and you saw the top three areas um, that are, are saying no to, to relocations in order to do that. Um, so that would be one area. We always ask, would well, you do an ROI? We know that many companies don't, but I, I will tell you that uh, recruiters, uh, as, as hopefully you have that opportunity to work with them more, is you can increase the numbers if they have a better understanding of who they're trying to recruit and why those people aren't accepting those offers. 
um, the success is, is getting the family integrated, you know, and when you, you look at this and you know that, you know, yes, singles are 30%, but I shared with you that a third of those are single parents. Getting people integrated outside of work is going to keep them and retain them longer. And if we know that most people only stay with a company four years and millennials are staying less than three, we just have to make sure that we're trying to get them connected uh, into those new communities and, and, and to get their life uh, moved into that area. Spouse partner employment, great time to be looking for a job and all different levels of jobs. So we have people who always want to um, match up their policies based on the employee's level. Um, most VIPs, their spouses are not looking for VIP high-level jobs, so we always encourage people, let us put them in the appropriate program. They need help as much as everyone else, but they have a different situation, and many of them are in different, uh, different vocational areas. The other thing is to keep the employee engaged. Make sure the employee knows that we're trying to, to work with the family. We always share with the employee what we're doing with the spouse as far as the job search so that they are connected um, and, and letting them know that, you know, that a part of this program is to help them uh, being able to do that. We, we know last year the Department of Labor said it took 35 weeks for somebody, a, a professional, to find a, a job in the United States, and, and we're just really pleased most of ours average about 15. 15 weeks is still a long time, and so if you look at somebody that's making $50,000 a year, um, you just don't usually have uh, 15 or 20 weeks of, of money to lose while you're changing jobs. So being able to get them employed, getting spouses employed uh, quicker, the days of having the employee making three and four times the amount of money as the spouse are, are pretty much gone now. And I shared with you a little bit earlier about the skilled jobs. Many of the skilled jobs are, are paying two and three times what uh, some of our folks coming out of college are doing. And then, you know, I think the final answer is when you ask your employees to, to relocate their willingness to, um, to relocate again. And we always try to look at that and, and decide um, when we see people come back through the system uh, and they are relocating maybe three years later, um, it's nice to know that, um, you know, they're, number one, they're still with the company, and number two, they've had a good relocation. And, and so much of the support that's provided by you all make that um, a reality. But uh, companies are going to continue to to need to move people, and uh, hopefully we can look at the policies and the challenges that are out there in today's society and uh, be able to match those up a little bit better to uh, to improve those. So that's about it, and I just really appreciate the opportunity and time to, to share that with you. Shan, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thanks a lot, Ed. Great presentation. Uh, okay, folks, I'm just going to pull this up for just a second uh, so everyone can take a look at it. Um, this is your recertification instructions for ERC CRP credits and for HRCI human resources credits. This slide is also included in the handout that you should have received about 11 a.m. Central, so a couple of hours prior to the webinar. If you did not receive one of those presentation handouts, please let us know in the Q&A and we'll make sure to get it emailed to you. And for HRCI, I know uh, number three there says that approval is still pending, but I actually received the email shortly before coming in here to pull up the broadcast that it has been approved. So if you're an HRCI holder, go, you can go ahead and submit for credit right away. And for CRP holders, since we've already applied for pre-approval, you should not be charged when submitting for your CRP credit. So now I'm going to open up our last couple of minutes to look at any questions that we've gotten in from our audience. So everyone will bear with me for just a second. I'm going to go to our window and see if we've had any come in. Ed, you must have covered everything because I do not see a single question in our box. Well, that's great. <laughs> Well, okay, everyone, I guess on uh, that note, we've had a lot of interesting information that we discussed today, and we do our best to only keep you for one hour, so we're going to go ahead and start wrapping up here. Uh, if anyone starts sending questions in as, as we're wrapping up, those are recorded by GoToWebinar, so we can definitely get those to Ed and get those answered and sent out to, to everybody. I would like to let all of the corporate members of our audience know that they will be receiving a $5 gift card in appreciation for their time and their attendance. 
And before we close, I'd like to offer our thanks to Ed for compiling and sharing this presentation with us. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending this afternoon. We recognize your time is valuable. So from all of us at Altair Global, thanks for spending part of your day with us, and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.